with us. We want you to know you're our honored guest and invite you back at every opportunity that you have. We're going to start a worship tonight by singing number 874. Number 874. Walking along at eve and viewing the skies afar, bidding the darkness come to welcome me, silver star. I have a great delight in the wonderful scenes above. God in his power and might is showing his Next song will be number 877. Number 877. When with the Savior we enter the glory land, won't it be wonderful there? Into the troubles and cares of the story land, won't it be wonderful together. Dear Father in heaven, we're thankful for this day that you have given us. We're thankful for all the many blessings you bestow upon us each day of our lives. We're thankful for our food, shelter, and clothing that we oftentimes take for granted, but we are thankful for these. We're thankful for this opportunity that we can gather together as your people and worship you, the only true and the only living God. Pray that our worship here tonight will be in accordance to thy will and that we will humble ourselves before your throne and worship you in spirit and in truth. Father in heaven, we're thankful for the church throughout the world, especially here in Ripley. We pray your richest blessings on each family that's represented here and we pray that you be with our elders and give them wisdom as they lead us and be with the deacons and the preachers and every member that we will all work together and love one another to spread your word. 
The Father in heaven, we're thankful for your word and the power that it has to influence our lives and to change our lives and to show us your will. And we just pray that we open up our hearts and our minds to your word and to obey it and to lead others to Christ. The Father in heaven, we're thankful for this nation that we live in and the freedoms that we have. We just pray that you be with this nation and that we will turn to thee and be with our leaders, that they will seek thee for wisdom and the decisions that they make that influence our lives and not for their own self that make their laws. The Father in heaven, we're also thankful for the avenue of prayer that we can come before you and give our petitions before thee and we pray that you be with all those that are sick and with their families that that you'll restore them to their health if it's thy will and be with the ones who have lost their loved ones that you will comfort them. Father in heaven, we're also thankful for our military personnel and our first responders, our missionaries, our health care workers and our teachers. We just pray that you be with them and keep them safe as they perform their duties. Most of all, dear Lord, we're thankful for your son who came to this earth and lived a perfect life and then died so that we would have that hope of eternal life with thee. We pray now that you forgive us of our sins. This is our prayer in Christ's name. Amen. Psalm for a lesson this evening will be number 719. Number 719. Angry words, oh, let them never from the tongue on bridal slip. May the heart's best impulse ever check them ere they so love him. The one on song this evening will be number 944. What shall it be? 944. this evening. Uh, as you can see on the screen, if you want to turn to John 13, that's where we're going to be tonight. 
Uh, before we get into that, I want to talk a little bit about movies. There we go. Um, I, I love watching movies, and, and this is actually something I've tried to set up with the kids. We have not been able to, to make this event happen yet, but I, I'm not a big horror movie fan, and I think one of the reasons why I don't like horror movies very much is because to enjoy them, I feel like you have to be in the movie and really in the moment and paying attention and almost putting yourself in that situation where I'm the kind of person, if I'm watching a horror movie, I'm thinking, huh, I wonder how they got that special effects to work. Or, you know, if some people can just sit and watch an, a magic show and be amazed. And I'm always the kind of, he's got something in the other hand, right? You know, how does he do this? And I always try, I can't be in the moment and just enjoy things. So I, I really love things like the, if you remember the Mystery Science Theater with the, the man and the two robots that just make fun of bad movies. I've tried to set that up to where we have events like that, making fun of bad movies. Or the two old men in uh, Muppets, that, that cranky old men that would, be me to AT. If I was uh, able to get a job doing that, it would be wonderful. I'd love it. Uh, but just making fun of movies and things like that. And I love seeing the, the tropes and the, the things that come o over and over again in movies. And, and one of the ones I noticed, it doesn't happen as much lately, but uh, I would say in the early 2000s, maybe a little bit in the late 90s, uh, or, or what I call childhood, uh, just to make some of you feel a little bit old. But a trope where uh, the hero would be in the standoff with the villain and he'd have one shot left and he'd throw it and the villain would dodge it. He'd say, hi, ah, you missed. And he said, no, I didn't. And something would blow up behind him because he was actually aiming at something else. Uh, I looked up a list of them and, and it had a couple of Batman movies, uh, mostly animated ones. And, and Frozen evidently did it. I don't know. I watched it once. Uh, and then, might I mention, please no one introduce this movie to my daughter. She's never seen it before, and I don't want to start it, so please don't, please don't do that to me. Uh, Captain America Civil War does it once or, or twice, I think, in it. And then just uh, almost every James Bond movie ever was listed on this, this, uh, this trope. I am not a James Bond fan, but, fan, but uh, evidently they do this trope a lot. The, the idea of you, you, you think they're aiming for one thing, but they're actually aiming for something behind them. The reason I bring this up is because I feel like when we're reading the Bible, one of the reasons that it pays to read it multiple times is because you read it in different states of mind and you, you catch different things and you look at different things. So a lot of times uh, you see people hitting the target over and over again and every once in a while maybe you'll read it and be thinking of it in a different way and you'll hit this target that was behind it, and you'll, you'll see it in a different light than you ever had. I talked about this a little bit uh, in an article I wrote a few weeks ago uh, about the, the Hall of Fame of Faith in Hebrews and how uh, normally when we talk about that, we talk so much about, look at all these great men, and absolutely, I mean, you can look at it, talk about it that way, and you're hitting the target perfectly. But it, it goes on so many times, it says, by faith, Abraham, by faith, Sarah, by faith, uh, Moses, by faith, and it goes off and rattles all these names. But the first by faith that you see is by faith, you. And, and I think if you read that, that chapter in a different way, if you, if you maybe aim for this target behind it and see these men all did these great things by faith, now what can you do by faith? It's a different perspective of looking at it. It's a different way of looking at it. And, and I think it's, it, it is helpful and very interesting. And, and uh, we're going to do that to an extent tonight, uh, at least for one of our, our points. But uh, we're going to talk about John 13. And as you can tell uh, by the foot up there, this is the, the chapter where Jesus washes the feet of the apostles. Uh, so first off, if you, if you want to open up and kind of go along with me, we're going to do a summary, and then we're going to go back and look at a few of the points. Uh, it starts off with uh, the first verse. I, I think this is very interesting because uh, it says that Jesus knew his time was coming to an end. He knew he was not going to have much time left with the apostles. And one of the last things he wants to do with his apostles is wash their feet. One of the last things he wants to do is give them this lesson. But... Uh, in verses 2 through 5, you see where he gets up and begins to, to put the towel around him and takes off his outer garments and begins to wash his feet. And then he, he gets to Peter and has this conversation with Peter, which is one of the things that we're going to take a look at. But uh, through verses 6 through 11, he has this conversation with Peter. And then he kind of explains the point of why he was doing what he was doing. Uh, so with, with that kind of summary in mind, so you know uh, where we are and the context of what we're talking about, we will start in 13 
through 16. And, and the reason I want to start here is uh, this is the target, like I talked about, the main target that we see. Uh, this is discussed over and over again, and, and there's a good reason why, because uh, Jesus explains himself here uh, and tells exactly what he means and why he is doing uh, what he is doing in, in verses 13 through 16. Uh, you call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you also should do, uh, just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. So you see here that Jesus is telling them, yes, I, I, you call me teacher, you call me Lord, you're absolutely right, I am those things, but look how I've humbled myself to get here, come here and, and wash your feet. And, and I'm not the person to ask. I'm sure there's all kind of people out there who can, can explain to you the cultural significance of, of watching, washing people's feet so much better than I can. I mean, the obvious things are there, that they don't have shoes, uh, they don't walk around with socks and shoes like we do, so they're in sandals, and their feet are very much dirtier than they uh, would be if you're walking around the streets today. But uh, there's so much that goes into uh, Jesus putting himself low enough to have washed his apostles' feet like this. And he tells them, you know, it doesn't matter who you are. You're not too good uh, to do this. And, I, and obviously this is hitting the main target. This is if, if putting ourselves in the illustration that I mentioned earlier. You're, you're hitting the, the villain that's right in front of you. Uh, and, and it's a great thing. And I, I think one of the things, we always look at it and we say, you know, you're not too good to serve. And I think most people in here would say, yeah, you're right, I want to serve. And then you, you get started listing the things that you might want to do. And you know, take out the trash? Ugh. You know, that's a, I don't know if I want to do that. Maybe give me more, one of the more glamorous jobs. Uh, I think that's one of the ways that, that uh, people kind of read this verse and get the idea of it, but don't really see the full picture of it. Uh, because you know, people seem to want to do the... They want to serve, but they want to serve in the way that they want to serve, not in the way that maybe we need them to serve. In our, in our guys' class on Wednesday nights... Uh, we've been having a, a leadership class. Last Wednesday, the, the elders came up there and, and answered a few questions for them. And uh, one of the things I told them at the end was, look, I know this is not the most interesting class that we've had. Uh, and it's not because the elders were boring. It wasn't because I was boring. It's just because sometimes the work that has to be done is not exciting. It's not glamorous. It just kind of has to be done. So here you see Jesus lowering himself, humbling himself, and, uh, you know, it's one of those things. It's, it's a point that's been made so many times. I don't feel like I can make it much better than uh, Jesus did here, saying, you are not better just because you are this or that. You are never too good to serve. But this was something that I have never really looked at very closely uh, until I started studying for this lesson. Uh, in, in verse 6, you see where... He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? And I find it interesting, uh, a book written by John MacArthur, it's called Twelve Ordinary Men. I've referenced it several times. It's a wonderful book going through each individual uh, apostle and, and kind of breaks down all that we know about them. And uh, one of the things that he, uh, I can't remember if he was claiming that this was the case or if he was just saying that this was a theory that a lot of people have, uh, when, especially in John, because John and Peter were likely very, very close friends, whenever it says Simon as opposed to Peter, whenever he uses that name Simon, uh, which if you remember when he met Jesus, Jesus changed his name to Peter or to Cephas. Uh, but whenever he used Simon, it's almost like him saying, all right, now you're going back to the person that you used to be. So the, the inclusion of Simon Peter here is, is kind of interesting to me. I don't know if it means anything. I don't know if that's really what John meant when he was writing here. But he says, uh, he came to Simon Peter who said, Lord, do you wash my feet? And I see that, and the question that I have is, who was the first person's feet that Jesus washed? And I think that kind of does make a difference in this verse alone. I think when you get into the, far, the, the, the verses as we go, uh, it, it doesn't change anything. But I think it changes it just for this question. Because if, if Peter was first and Jesus came to him and he says, Whoa, you're going to wash my feet, it kind of makes sense. He's shocked. He doesn't know what's going on. He hasn't done this to anyone else yet. But if, you know, Peter's 
three or four or five down the line, you just got to think Peter's sitting there watching it, and he's, he's thinking, I'm going to look really good here. He's like, yeah, you can wash their feet. Uh-uh, you're not going to wash my feet. You know, I understand how much better than, than, uh, than me you are. So it's almost an arrogant question if he's not the first one. And I'm sure there's multiple different ways that, that you could view that, but uh, either way, you see some surprise from Peter. Like, you, you're washing my feet? Uh, but it goes on, and uh, Jesus tells him, what I'm doing, you're not, you, you, you don't understand it right now, but just wait. And what I feel like is happening here is Jesus is trying to use an object lesson. He's trying to use his apostles to, to prove a point, and Peter's not playing along. And, and uh, I actually went to, to Freed a few weeks ago to, to have lunch with Donnie, and uh, the, the speaker was, was talking about a basketball player and uh, how much he loved watching him play, and then he asked the, uh, the player, do you think you could make uh, ten free throws with his, your eyes closed? Now, he was way in the back, so I, I didn't hear what he said or, or what he did, but with the way the speaker responded, I had the feeling that he said, yeah, yeah, I feel like he could do that, when the speaker really wanted to say, oh, no, there's no way I could do that. You know, he wasn't playing along with the object lesson. And I kind of felt for the guy because, man, I've done that a lot. <laughs> and I know how hard it is to get your point across when the person you're working with is not playing along. And here, Peter seems like he's not playing along with Jesus. He's not, uh, he's not allowing him to move forward with this. He just says, chill out. I, I know you don't get it right now. You're going to. I'm going to explain it to you. Uh, but G uh, Peter says, you shall never wash my feet. And, and the reason that I say that who was first? Who was the first person to have their feet washed? It doesn't matter past that verse because here I genuinely think, regardless of how Peter asked that question, here he was saying, I understand the relationship here. I understand to an extent who you are. You know, Thomas's confession later on where he says, my Lord and my God is so special because it's the first time that they, he acknowledges uh, the deity the, the way that he does. But uh, to an extent, Peter, probably more than most of the apostles, understands who Jesus is and says, no, there's, there's no way. You are far above me. There's no way I'm letting you wash my feet. But Jesus responds to that and, and says, if, you do, if I do not wash your feet, then I have no, you have no part with me. So Peter being Peter, uh, kind of takes it to an extreme after that. says, okay, if, if that's the case, don't just wash my feet, wash my hands and my head, wash everything. If, if that's what it takes to be with you, then I do everything. Uh, but the answer from Jesus here is a little bit cryptic, and it's very interesting to me, and uh, it took a little while for me to understand. And I'm sure if you talk to other people, you might get some different takes on it, but I'm going to give you mine here. Uh, the one who was, has bathed does not need to wash, except for his feet, but is completely clean. And what I get from that is you, you think of who Jesus is talking to, who he is having a conversation with. Uh, and, and like I said earlier, in true Peter fashion, Peter is an over-the-top kind of guy. Peter is a, an all-or-nothing kind of guy. He doesn't do anything halfway. And he's having this discussion with him and, and saying, if I need to be washed, you know, wash everything. And, and the way that Jesus is talking here, what I really think of is when he's talking to the Samaritan woman at the well in John 4 and he has this conversation with her, whoever drinks this water will not thirst again. And I feel like what Jesus is saying to Peter here is, look, you've been cleaned, you've been bathed, you're not going to need to again. What he's saying is, is my grace is sufficient. I have washed your sins clean, you're not going to need to do that again. So if you've already taken a bath, if you've become clean, why would you need to bathe again? And again, in their, in their culture, in their, this time, they're walking around with sandals, so yeah, your feet need to be cleaned again, but you don't need to clean your whole body again. And I, I think that's what he's saying here. Peter being this guy who, uh, I would say, just from what we see of him, would go on through the rest of his life and reach points where he feels like he's made so many mistakes and done so wrong that... He needs to have those sins forgiven again. And Jesus says, no, you're, you're good. You have been cleaned. And I, I hear so many times of, of people in denominations saying, oh, I was rededicated or, or rebaptized or however it was. And, uh, you know, I, I think I've mentioned before I was uh, dunked in water when I was 12, but I had no idea what I was doing. And then when I got older, uh, I was actually baptized. And, you know, that's not rebaptism. That's baptism for the first time. But I feel like Peter here 
he's almost telling him because he knows who he will be in the future. And I'm not telling you that's the absolute fact. I'm not saying that's the absolute truth of it. Uh, I'm saying it's a very cryptic passage. Maybe that's what he meant. Maybe you might have a different take. But uh, either way, it's an interesting, interesting thing to see here. But we get to, well, that was supposed to pop up later. I love when I do that. But you get to this part here and you read 21 through 30 and there's nothing specifically said in that section that I, I really want to point out. There's nothing specifically uh, in that section that harkens back too much to exactly what we're talking about here. The thing that I want to point out is who is there? Who is present when all of this is going on? Uh, verse 21, he starts talking about who will betray him. And eventually he tells him that Judas would betray him and told Judas to leave. I want to stop here and talk a moment about weddings. Because. But I've seen weddings a lot of times where people will wash the, their spouse's foot, feet during a wedding. And if you did that, I, not trying to offend you, I, I don't think it's a great way to start a marriage, mostly because if we started by Megan seeing my feet, I don't know if the wedding would have continued. But... You know, I think it's a very good gesture to say, you know, I'm, I'm serving you in this way. I think it's, it's fine. But having been married for not very long, but about five years now, I see that and I think that's, that's the bare minimum. If you're not willing to wash your spouse's feet, you don't need to get married. If you're not willing to serve in that way, you don't need to get married. You're not ready for it. I'm, I'm doing my first wedding in a few months. One of my friends asked me to marry them, and I, I'm kind of thinking, you know, I need to have some kind of meeting with them and talk to them and what I'm going to say, you know, things like, uh, if you can't trust your spouse with money to share a bank account, you don't need to get married, and, uh, you know, do this, do that, and, and, and this is one of them. If you're not willing to serve in that way, uh, and, and I say this because my wife is at home trying not to go into labor too soon right now, but, you know, once your wife gets pregnant, if you're not willing to do things like rub her feet, you're not ready to be married. So they look at this, and this is the absolute bare minimum that you should do uh, for someone that you love. And you think, you know, would you wash your best friend's feet? Uh, my best friend is a hairy 300-pound beast of a man. And it might be a little gross, but yeah, I'd, I'd wash Jonathan's feet. I'd go down the list. I've got several people who I look at and say, yeah, probably. But what's interesting here is Jesus washed Judas' feet. And, and you look back, Jesus knew what Judas was about to do. You, you look at the second verse, and Jesus knew exactly what Judas was about to go and do. He was about to go betray him. Uh, you look at betrayals throughout history, and, and you, know, you, you know the name uh, uh, Benedict Arnold, and, and you, you hear about these people who have betrayed other people. And, yeah, it's, it's war, okay? Uh, you, you hear about in... in mob movies and things about people betraying each other and, you know, the whole uh, stitch, snitches get stitches. And I always tell people, you know who came up with that saying? People who were doing something they weren't supposed to be doing in the first place. So when you talk about the biggest betrayals in history, I can't think of a bigger one than what Jesus knew Judas was about to do to him. But he washed his feet. It's easy to wash the feet of people that you love. It's easy to serve the people that you love. It's easy to be there for the people that you love. It's a lot harder for the people that you don't like. And it, I mean, it's interesting, I think back to like my time at Freed and I, I think about looking around the campus at how many people that, like if I go back to the lectureships today, I'm, I weave a lot because I'm trying to avoid some people. For the most part, it's just because I don't like talking to people a lot, so you know, I'm trying to avoid them. There were some people that I genuinely did not like at Freed. You know what, that's okay. Because I didn't hate them. It wasn't like we, we got in fights or anything. It was just they had a personality, I had a personality, those personalities didn't jive. I'm going to go out on a limb and say there are some people in this room that have some perfect personalities that don't get along. And provided that that doesn't cause issues, provided that uh, you don't hate that person, provided that you can get along in, in God's church and still push forward for what is best, I mean, 
people talk bad about cliques, and they can be taken to an extreme and, and hurt churches a lot. But what they're really saying is, you know, some people get along with some people better than others. Yes, absolutely. So are there going to be people in this world that you just don't really get along with, that you don't really like? Absolutely. Are there going to be people in this world outside of, outside of this group of people that spit in your face, that insult you, that hate you? Absolutely. Are there going to be people who stab you in the back and betray you? Very likely. Wash their feet. It's really easy to do that for the people that you love. It's like shooting a layup. It's what I tell Megan all the time. She'll say, oh, oh, Carly came in and she did this. She put all the toys away tonight. Okay, that's what she's supposed to do. Why am I supposed to pat her on the back for that? She's two. She should do that by now. It's a joke. But, but you know, basketball player shoots a wide open layup. Why am I supposed to pat you on the back for that? That's what you're supposed to do. That's easy. You go do something for this congregation, somebody in this congregation. You do something for somebody that you love. Why am I going to pat you on the back for that? Go wash Judas's feet. And this week as you leave and, and you go about your life, I, I encourage you to do that. Go find a Judas and go wash their feet. Don't tell them you're comparing them to Judas. But go find somebody that you wouldn't consider your best friend. Go find somebody that you don't know that well and serve them. Be the image of Jesus for them. And we offer this invitation tonight. If you look at yourself and see that you're not hitting either target, maybe you're not serving those who you should be serving, and maybe you're definitely not serving those who you don't normally think about serving. Now, we offer this invitation uh, that we can help you in any way that we can, and if you've heard the good news and you would like to have your sins washed away in baptism, we offer that now too, and we ask that you come as we stand and as we sing. Jesus, to you. And you must give an answer for something you must do. What shall it be? What shall it be? What shall your answer be? Thank everyone for being here tonight. If you're visiting with us, we hope you come back at every opportunity. Just a few announcements here tonight. Brother Glenn Fan has been placed on hospice. Please remember him, Judy, and Darla in your prayers. On Sunday, May 1st, we'll have an evangelism training day. Lance Mosher, a missionary in residence at FHU, will share practical how-to lessons on personal evangelism. Copies of the year-ending financial statement are on the table with the collection basket in the foyer if you'd like to pick one of those up as you leave. A table has been set up in the foyer to shower Megan and Cody uh, and their new daughter, Sadie Jane, that's expected in March. 
All Bible class teachers who are teaching or plan to teach are encouraged to attend the teacher meeting March 19th with Robin Nunley Chapman. She'll be going over uh, some new curriculum uh, for our classes. There's a sign-up sheet for anyone willing to do the Wednesday night invitation. If you will, please see that. There's a sign-up sheet also for making music at FHU on April 1st. Sharon Monson, Carla Kula's mother, had a stroke, and she's in the hospital at Nashville and asking for prayers. Please remember her in your prayers. Brother Mike Bennett has a closing prayer tonight. The Lord's Supper has been prepared for anyone who is unable to take this morning, if you will. Turn right after you exit the auditorium done the singing of our last song, and someone will be there in the east wing to assist you. Number 538, number 538, will you please stand? <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest friend, but